Great. All right. So let's get started. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the 14th episode of the Risk Mentorship Series for the Rising Smart Water Professionals. Uh, welcome to all the new faces in the crowd and welcome back to all the familiar faces. We encourage you to leave your cameras on so we can see each other, give a wave to all your friends in the crowd. Uh, don't be shy, introduce yourselves in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're from, where you work. So this event is being hosted by SWAN, the Smart Water Networks Forum, a global nonprofit, which is the leading hub for the smart water and wastewater sectors and RISP, the Rising Smart Water Professionals, SWAN's young professional community for those interested in joining or advancing the smart water sector. So we developed this member ecosystem map to present a snapshot of SWAN's global members, which represent the full spectrum of leading stakeholders in the smart water sector from idea to pipe. So last week we held our 12th annual SWAN conference where young professionals were front and center. So I'd like to invite Nina Rossiter of Bluefield Research to share a little bit about her experience as an attendee at the conference and also as a speaker on the conference stage. So welcome Nina. Hi everyone. Um, I guess, so this was my first ever SWAN conference that I've attended and the last conference I've been to, the first one on the job uh, was the Esri conference late last year, but I really liked uh, the size of SWAN because it is fewer, it's like a few hundred attendees and I could, you know, put the faces to the names or the bodies to all the names of people that I've been interacting with so far. Um, and I'm a digital water analyst at Bluefield Research, we're a market research firm. So this conference really just helped me, you know, build uh, build further knowledge on, on the different smart solutions in the water sector. And what stood out to me is I think SWAN really encourages young professionals to come up and, and get more engaged, which I think is more intimidating in a, in a larger conference setting, uh, especially for myself. And the last panel was my favorite thing as well because it was about diversity and inclusion. Um, so I think the majority of clients that I have worked with or spoken to at work are much older and male and, and typically more white. Um, so that's not to say I haven't had the space to feel heard or gain career opportunities, but I think having a mentorship uh, where, you know, there's uh, people from all over the world with different ages and backgrounds and ethnicities is just really important. And so I'm excited to to get more involved in, in RISP and, and just help us all be cheerleaders to one another, um, whether it's, you know, whatever water vertical we're in or whether we're trying to get into the water space. Awesome, thank you so much, Nina, for sharing your insights. It was great having you at the conference and great having you here today. Uh, so we want, like we mentioned already, we'd love for all of you to get more involved with RISP and really take an active role so just a couple of opportunities. Um, we just closed our nomination process for the leadership team. We received some really, really great applications. So stay tuned. We're gonna be announcing some new members of the leadership team in the coming weeks. Um, also our mentorship series. We'd love to have you guys more involved. If you have any ideas for mentors that you would like to see on the next episode, please let us know. We have our ambassador program. We have about 13 global ambassadors doing great things in the smart water sector. Check out our ambassador spotlights on LinkedIn, learn more about what the ambassadors are doing and how they're helping to promote smart water and their different organizations and countries and regions all over the world. And we'll be launching a new cohort uh, early next year. So stay tuned for more information about that. Also for those of you who love to write, uh, we're always looking for people to write on our blog. Just so you guys know, a few years ago, a young woman decided to write a blog about her key takeaways from the SWAN conference. That same person, Emma Weisbord, became the risk leadership team uh, chair. This year, she actually spoke on the closing panel at the conference. So just so you guys can see, writing one little blog can get you a lot of exposure and really help to launch your smart water career. So if that's something you're interested in, please don't be shy, reach out to myself or Billy or the rest of the leadership team. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Billy Rassman, uh, one of our leadership team members. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. Yeah, I'm really excited about this panel today sort of on entrepreneurship in water. And especially you know, since I was able to attend the SWAN conference last week, you know, I was able to, to meet one of the panelists, Adele, 
um, and we had great conversations, you know, not just about Smart Water and his amazing programming expertise and his very cool story, but also just about life and really connecting at a different level. So I'm just really excited to be able to talk to Adele again, and then also to, to speak with Anna Poporesna and Savan Zamir. Um, so just to give you an idea of how um, just amazing each of their CVs are, I uh, just wanna give you a, a brief intro to each of them. So Savan is um, the vice president of Xylem Innovation Labs. So Xylem is a large um, water technology corporation um, that had you know, a big presence at SWAN. Um, she and her team scout and test new technologies developed um, by universities and startup companies uh, with the goal of helping to solve water by bringing new technologies to market faster. So she started her career studying civil engineering at UC Berkeley in Stanford. And then she moved to Israel to spend a decade as the founder of not one, but two water technology startup companies. So Anna is um, the founder of Smart for Tech, which seeks to address water efficiency and security through um, the merge of the circular economy, uh, innovation, and finance. Anna is the author of the Water Trade Finance chapter in the book Transforming Climate Finance and Green Investment with Blockchain. And she is a contributor to the UN COP24, Bloomberg Environment, Global Water Intelligence, the Water Report UK, and EBRD publications and discussions. So last but not least, Adele is the founder of Ingeniousware, which focuses on digitization of engineering processes, including software development, consulting services, uh, and professional courses. So Adele has a PhD in water distribution system optimization, and he has a strong background in multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and data analytics. He also has over five years experience at the university teaching courses on urban hydraulic and computer programming for hydraulic engineers. So again, um, just so excited um, to, to get to, to see all of you, uh, to get to meet all of you. Um, you know, I guess, Adele, since we, we got to meet last week at the SWAN conference and get the conversation started, um, you know, we had a lot of conversations about kind of your journey and how you started programming with a pen and paper. You were writing out script with pen and paper, which just blew my mind um, to be able to debug code just in your head. It's like playing virtual chess, or something like that, just <laughs> chess in your head. So I, I guess, can you tell people kind of about your journey and about, you know, how you ended up where, where you are today? Yes, Billy. Now, first of all, thanks a lot, Billy, for the invitation and thanks to Swan for organizing something like this. I think it is amazing to have all these young people and, and professionals already just uh, making their career on the small water um, world, let's say like this. So it was a nice conversation with you at, at Swan. So we, I remember we were talking about it. My beginning in computer programming was at the age of 10, 11, more or less. I was uh, I born I was born in Cuba. I grew up in Cuba. So at that time, I was attending visiting a computer club, introducing things about computer. But we didn't have a computer for each of us. So that's why at the beginning we had to learn to program using a piece of paper. So um, it was the beginning. It was like this during a long time. And really, believe me, uh, it was helping me a lot, and it helped me until today. Today I know several professionals, software developers, they have a problem and they go directly to the computer. They don't have time to think, to write an algorithm. They cannot debug in their mind. And for me, at the beginning, it was very challenging, but it, it is helping me until today. It is really helping until today. That's great. Well, I love it. With, I love with, it. with the time, I have to change. So with the time, I started hydraulic engineering. So I get graduated after a lot of experience programming. I get graduated from hydraulic engineering. And then I fall in love with the water uh, industry and human water models and like, things like this, where I was able to apply it on all what I have been learning before from computer programming. So today, I'm just a kind of hybrid between computer programming and hydraulic engineering. And that is what I'm doing in the company. That is what I love to do. And I think I will be keeping doing that until the end. <laughs> 
That's great. I love that. You know, really starting with programming and problem solving and then finding water as a, a place to, to apply those skills. I love that. Yes, yes. It was it was like this. And um, it is um, a fascinating work when you can program things, build things with your hands, do what you want to do with, your, with a computer. But it is even better when you can apply to some specific topic, to some specific domain where you can see the results and bring value to people based on that. Yeah, I totally agree. That's amazing. So I think to shift to, to Anna, you know, can you tell us a bit about your story? You know, why did you choose to be an entrepreneur? Um, you're involved in you know, blockchain, circular economy, things that I think people are hearing a lot about, but maybe don't know exactly the details of those. Um, and then what led you to the water sector? Uh, first of all, I'd also like to thank uh, among uh, you all these bright spirits and minds, just fascinating. Probably I, I, I'm, I'm the, I feel myself a minority now. Everyone has PhD and I'm like, all right, I don't. <laughs> but it, that, it didn't stop me to have my engineering mindset and being curious about solving the problem. So similar to Idel, I was always uh, interested in the rabbit holes which brought me uh, to the, some most uh, unusual places. And the journey started for me in the um, uh, reconstruction and redevelopment and redesign, concept redesign of the placemaking. So the physical environments like buildings, retail shopping centers from the marketing, branding or architecture perspective without being an architect. So I was always like that white or black ship, which I could see the vision, but then you need to organize the people who actually can translate your vision and what you have in your head into the practical terms, language, and most importantly, their purposeful slash profitable project. And it's a challenge because not everyone sees what you see. And you have to have people like yourself here to share the same type of energy, aspirations, and, and, and desire to achieve outcomes with shared values and tangible values to deliver the change. It's a multidisciplinary task. That brought me into the digital world later and supply chains. And I wrote my thesis, thesis around efficiency, legitimacy, accountability of uh, sustainable development goals. They, at that time, there, it was just United Nations called Global Compact. So basically, what we can hear right now in the world, a lot of greenwashing. And um, at that time, I, I clearly understood, well, it's not that difficult to build sustainable business models. And then greenwashing is just an outcome, absolutely unnecessary. I have a feeling that it's much more costly or much more inefficient and expensive to spend money on the greenwashing rather than just do business good and <laughs> you don't need to do anything rest it's just like outcomes and that i started and that brought me and then injustice uh, brought me into water because if you have water and energy you can do anything people just need a bit of more access to uh, knowledge and maybe a bit of finance microfinance even and and then they can do anything and that's how I started looking. Then I quickly hit the wall that water is not monetizable. <laughs> so I was like, all right, how we can connect the purpose, pleasure, and everything else. Then that's where I ended up in Swan Network. I still remember Barcelona 2000, I think 17 or 18, where I was talking about blockchain and the all utility guys. First of all, I was the youngest one on the stage. I was 20, 28, I think. So then secondly, I'm talking about some unusual words and say like hey why don't we just create a shared registry called an open innovation system and then we build this this and this just like in pharmaceuticals <laughs> and they're looking at me what and i was like yeah and by the way we can create the water credits <laughs> and then i felt lunatic <laughs> on the stage <laughs> and now everyone talks about this <laughs> and it's obvious and then i quickly realized all right i need the support of hydrologists i need support of engineers i need support of geologists as well because it doesn't them it doesn't work because you've got to have a creative people to make it work in pilots. And that brought me into the further, would have brought me further into their natural resource management in the mineral space. And I think I found my dirty pond. It's still water. And uh, I think we can do here much more if we can combine hydrology, geology, and a bit of alchemistry. I call it symbolically, but in, in, the, in the natural world, it's biochemistry where we can actually clean up water and make some money and share this with communities. So, and apparently now it's called regenerative economy and regenerative revolution. So welcome to industry, not 4.0, but regenerative economy 1.0. So 
here I am, and here we are, or I am. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And I mean, I feel like I was hearing a lot of similar echoes from conversations that I had with Adele that, you know, starting in water, but then realizing uh, maybe the economics are difficult to apply a certain solution, but then going into energy or manufacturing and realizing that we can use a lot of the same tools and then try to bring those tools back to water where it makes sense. So yeah, I think that's a great kind of like, you know, theme that I'm seeing between you know, your work and Adele's work. Um, so to get to Sivan, um, yeah, I think your work seems a bit different. You're, you're very focused on water and you're also, you work for Xylem, which is, you know, a larger technology firm. Um, and I think probably many people here haven't actually worked for in the corporate environment. So what is it like to go from being this person in, in, uh, as a civil engineer in, in academia, and then founding two startups for a decade and then serving kind of in this larger corporate role. Uh, what has that been like? Um, well, that's, I mean, that's a, actually a really interesting question. And, um, I just want to let you know that I'm actually familiar with Swan from way back when, um, Amir Khan, you know, first joined as managing director when I was living in Israel and he and I were colleagues there as well. And he used to invite, uh, young professionals out to, um, Maybe he doesn't want me talking about this, but he used to invite young professionals out to uh, you know bars once a month or every other month um, that were in the clean tech space to talk about what they were doing in clean tech. So I know that he's long been championing you know people sharing their experiences and professional experiences, especially in the in the water and adjacent sectors. So, um, so I, I got to talk about um, some of my startup experiences. I was still in the startup phase uh, at that at that point in a, a couple of Tel Aviv bars um, late, you know, late night. So, uh, in any event, to your question, um, I get that question a lot, uh, which I'm sure is not surprising. You know, how is it going from being a, a founder and, and CEO of your own company and working for yourself, and and then moving over and working for a large corporation? Um, I don't think it's that. It's, it's that different, to be honest, uh, because when even when you are your own, let's say your own boss, quote unquote, working for a, a startup, you're not. You're, you uh, are beholden to your employees, to your customers, to your investors. I mean, they're all of your bosses. You've got lots and lots of bosses that you um, need to bring home, uh, you know, bring together. Um, and so what's interesting about working at a corporation is that I'm still working with lots of different stakeholder groups and lots of people, but we all have the same general mission and goal of making the umbrella, you know, company successful. Um, so that's a really interesting difference. And I would also say that I would never underestimate or undervalue how many skill sets you develop as an entrepreneur and, and working for yourself and building your own company that you may not realize because you're doing it out of necessity. And then all of a sudden you come into a place where people are very specialized. We've got a marketing department within marketing, people who do market research versus, you know, uh, branding versus um, putting together marketing collateral. Those are all different roles, right? Just within marketing. And so as an entrepreneur, you're used to doing the whole gamut by yourself from HR, marketing, finance. And, and so what's uh, interesting being at a, at a larger company is that I have to work with all of these different people and departments, and I'm very grateful that they do the work that they do so I can be more focused on the work that I'm doing. Uh, but I find it gives me a little bit of a leg up because I understand what they're doing and I appreciate what they're doing and I can fill in some of the gaps um, if, if need be. So, you know, there's just no better skill set that you could that you could develop than, I guess, developing all skill sets at the same time because you have no other option. And I see the entrepreneurs laughing as I'm as I'm saying this, because they all know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but I am very grateful to have the support now. It's uh, it's pretty wild. Yeah, no, I, I think that that resonates with me. I am, I can't even say that I'm an entrepreneur myself. But coming from you know, university background and trying to publish papers, and you're making every single figure, and you're writing proposals, you're you're a one person shop. Mm -hmm. And then when you start working with a team whatever that team is, and you can get people that, that focus on, oh, I can make that figure. I can, I can, I can massage your message and, and make it more understandable. You can just kind of really scale what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And working on teams is amazing. It sounds like you have a great team at Xylem to work with. 
Yeah, it's a it's a phenomenal team. And it's not just a large company in water. It's one of the largest companies in, <laughs> in water. It's a Fortune 1000 with um, over 17,000 people globally with presence in over 100 countries and uh, at one point over a $22 billion market cap. So it's it's a fairly large organization to go from, yeah. you know, 10 to 50 people to 17,000. It's a, you know, it's a whole other, whole other beast there. Yeah, no, I can only imagine. And so, I mean, these were just, I think, amazing stories from, from each of you, your journeys. Um, you know, I kind of want to shift over to kind of the core part of this, the series mentorship. And I think it's probably going to be a bit different for each of you than our past mentors, which I think have more risen through a company on more maybe traditional engineering path or through a utility. Um, here, I feel like if you're an entrepreneur, you kind of have to, you know, grab mentors from here and there along your journey, um, really network a lot. And so I'd really be interested to hear your, your answers to these questions. So let's start with the first question. Um, are there any things that have helped you to get you where you are now in your career as a smart water professional and any things that you tried, but didn't help? Okay. So I'm trying to think for this question, um, maybe Anna, can you, can you go over here? I know you kind of called yourself, you know, kind of industry agnostic. You're, you're in a bunch of different realms, but are there, you know, rows you went down that didn't end up panning out and then, or things that you've, you've really invested a lot of time in that have paid dividends and say, oh yeah, I would definitely recommend doing that again. Um, yeah, it's been a rosy and bumpy um, roads full of uh, sacrifices. Looking back, I would definitely say uh, some of them were unnecessary but it's my personal journey. So I think it's important to understand your skill set. And I think I will repeat the very much basics. Focus on what you know, not what you don't know. Really, this is, will save so much time, so much efforts. And to be specific, because sometimes it's very abstract, right? So then I heard it hundreds of times. So I invest in project development, business development. Right, I can connect the macro dots, but I don't see sometimes the first step how to connect asset uh, management to asset management. And that's where I'm focused right now when I'm talking asset management. And then I want to connect it to sustainable finance. And I see something that no one else see. I want to develop a new asset class, which is not new. And I have no idea how to do it in the fastest way. So instead of trying to do the research and everything, yes, you've got to do the basic research. You can't come to the mentors and say, like, hey, I have this awesome idea. It's like, great, go do your homework. But what, when you've done your homework, spend a couple of weeks putting down that paper, just go and be brave and do research, find the grants, uh, find the right uh, skill sets who can complement you. And if you hear, no, it's a shit idea, or like, what? Don't give up. It's pointless because then you uh, then you really fit in like in this tribe, and I found the such, such tribes, the bright tribes that, that do stand. And you know what made me uh, sometimes upset when I was speaking to one of the largest uh, mining companies, top one of the top two, and they said to me, Anna, you just told us uh, in ten minutes what we hired five big consultancies, and they told us after we've paid them five million. I started crying. So that gave you a sense that even if you don't have credibility, you've got to, uh, then you have maybe credibility by aligning with those people who have credibility and not necessarily um, try to break the, do the doors or windows or pathway where it's closed. Go back there later or let them come to you. Don't force, try to flow and uh, it's going to save you time but also it's very very important to coming back to the point uh, not uh, focus on what you don't know it's because usually what you know brings you passion and satisfaction this is why you know that i don't think quite often it's out of necessity and i think it supports Idel's point of that he's like suddenly he discovered that hey i can bring so much value by doing that in in something else and then suddenly everything falls into place and you just go, wow, at the speed of the SpaceX or even faster, the quantum speed. 
So that's my probably practical advice. And uh, don't be scared. I mean, there's so many things that we don't know. There's so many technologies are developing every day. And we've passed the times when it's simply uh, now about, oh, just do, let's do the registry of information. No, it's, it's a deep tech time. It's regenerative time. It's highly scientific time going to be. But there's still so many dots and, uh, and gaps needs to be filled. And you think that, yeah, but it's apparent for everyone. Suddenly you're a nice, no, it's not apparent because again, simple example. I was like, yeah, this is a new type of acid class. And I was like, obviously let's clean it up. And there's like, Anna, but you forgot one word. I was like, which one? It's obvious, it's asset management. <laughs> it's like, no, you forgot the keyword. I was like, what? Infrastructure. And I was like, Jesus Christ, can you imagine one word one specific word can change the whole thing. Then suddenly people understand you. And you kind of try and you think that you are creative, you're talking to uh, nonsense, but it's not nonsense. You just forgot one word. And the right people will tell you that one specific word, which quickly will open you the, the next uh, steps in your pathway and accelerates your development. That's great. So that's know what you do well, understand yourself, focus on, yeah, what your strengths are, but then also recognize where you have gaps to either build a team around you or to be able to do a deep dive and get the expertise if, it, if it's going to serve you kind of in the long run. So I think that's great. And being able to have a team around you that can tell you when oh, you need to use this language when you're talking to this person. They're not in asset management. They come from this part of the water sector or the energy sector. I think that's great. Um, I guess, so Adele, I'm going to go to you for this next question. Um, do you have a, a mentor? Um, have you ever had a mentor? And if so, what role did they play in your career? Um, and this can be someone that's older or younger. Um, I know I'm, I learned from everyone around me. I'm, I'm sure that I think based on talking to you, it's probably the same case. Yes, it is It is a very interesting question. As, as, as Anna was saying, sometimes just a word changed completely the whole story. And sometimes just the advice of a mentor, of a guy that came to you and told you, check this, it changed everything. And I, I, I have been hearing a lot about, well, people that have been talking to me, giving me advices, but I remember some of them very special. So I remember when I went to the university, I decided to study hydraulic engineer, but I was not so sure. I was thinking about changing to cybernetics, informatics. And there was a guy coming to me and telling me, well, God, you are very good in computer programming. No doubt about it, but you are not the number one here in computer programming. But if you come to me, study hydraulic here with me and keep on with your skill on computer programming, I guarantee you are going to have a very good place here on my side. And I was hearing his advice. And after that, I was completely convinced. Okay, I will start the first year here in hydraulic engineering. And after the first year, I realized about what Anna was saying, how I could bring value to people. And I realized, okay, all my, my colleagues at school, they were fighting a lot for calculating at every project. For me, it was like a macro in Excel or some code in Pascal, automating whatever I had to do in the project. And I was having fun with that. And I'm doing that until today. That is the, 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 the point. And, and during my career, I'm telling you, I had a couple of advices. After that, I remember another professor that technically speaking was teaching me a lot, but he was the one sending me to Barcelona to make my studies for the first time outside of Cuba. It was also a change totally in my mind. So I was, I grew up in Cuba, have never seen another country. And when I arrived to Barcelona, I saw the university in there, all the possibilities in there. It's like, a, wow, a new dimension in the, in the world. It changed also the, the story. And my final, my PhD advisor, well, I, I cannot talk about mentorship without mentioning him because he was like, a, well, we call him in our group, we call him a father. So now you can realize the dimension um, of that uh, mentorship. It is like a father for all, the people that have been onto that group, uh, onto this group, so Joaquin Izquierdo from the Polytechnic University of Valencia, and, and those are the people that have been practically shaping all uh, what I've been doing um, until now. Without those advisors, difficult to be at the place where, I've, where I'm today, and, I, and believe me, for the young professional. So look at the right advice, listen to the people, 
and, and try to find your way. And the guide is where can I bring more value to people, to business? Uh, what is the best I can do? And don't, don't, don't even think, don't, don't even doubt about it. That is the best path. Well, that, that's great. So you had basically mentors that convince you to pivot into hydraulic engineering. Yeah. Move across the world. Yeah. <laughs> start a whole new life. I mean, that's had a huge impact I mean, by listening to those people. Yes. So, um, yeah. And I think a lot of the RISP ambassadors have had a similar story. A lot of people coming from all par parts of the world ending up at different universities. I mean, that's a big leap. So that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, Savan, I'm going to you next. Um, what advice would you have, would you give to, you know, a rising young professional, um, someone who's a, maybe a recent graduate, um, trying to pivot into smart water. So what advice do you have for them? And what's maybe some advice you hear that you think is, is bad advice? Oh, all right. Um, so for somebody who's just starting out in their career, I would say a couple of things. One, communication is beyond important and uh, in, in both directions. I think Anna was touching it on, on it a little bit, both in the, in the way that you communicate uh, and also in terms of you know, how you perceive um, things from, from others. So in the way that you communicate, you have to understand different people of different levels of understanding. You have to, I always say, meet them where they are. So I work with water and wastewater operators all the time, right? And you have to think about how does this person communicate? This person is in front of their computer, maybe once a week on Fridays, otherwise they're walking around. And I can't tell you how many young professionals I've worked with that are that will say to me like, well, I emailed them. It's like, if you emailed them, you'll hear back from them in a month, pick up the phone, call them, like not just the words that you use to communicate, but literally the methods that you use for communication. Um, oftentimes water and wastewater uh, plant operators like to text message. So I will send them text messages, you know, instead of um, sending an email if I really need to get a hold of them. So you need to think about who is it that you're communicating with. Not everybody communicates in the way, in the style, through the, the um, channel that you're used to communicating in. Um, and then in terms of learning and understanding, there's so many buzzwords out there. You're all smart people, um, all studied, you know, at, at university, uh, whether it's science, engineering, something else, it doesn't really matter. People use a lot of different acronyms, use a lot of different terminologies that are really buzzwords. Take the time to talk to somebody to break it down for you um, and or research it online so you know what people are talking about. You can demystify it. Um, so I, I would say that that's another one. And then when you then communicate, don't use all the acronyms over again, because if you didn't understand it, then somebody else is not going to understand it. So at least make sure you define it in conversation. You're talking to somebody and don't assume that they that they know what it is. Um, the other thing that I would say is uh, it's a small industry despite, despite water being global. Um, it is a very, very small industry. Everyone knows each other. It's wild, the you know, connections that have reoccurred after years and years. Um, so really be kind. You never know who that person's going to be. Um, I worked with somebody who was not so nice to me. And years later, uh, I walked into a room um, being told, you know, I'm the new project manager on this project. And here are all these people that are going to be working for me. And this guy turns around, sees me and has a look of horror on his face because he realizes that now, you know, he's reporting to me years later in a different capacity at a different company in a different city. So you never know who you're going to come across again. Be, you know, be kind to people um, and it will, it will never hurt you to be kind to somebody. Um, and then last thing in, in terms of bad advice, I don't know about bad advice, but I really don't subscribe to people, you know, feeling like or saying uh, uh, that you need to have a specific goal in mind uh, or specific trajectory. Um, there are so many opportunities, especially in the water sector, that you're likely not even aware that exists. Um, and uh, when I started out, the role that I have today didn't exist. So it's not that I just didn't know about it at the time, 20 years ago, it didn't exist. So opportunities will come up along the way and just, you know, figure out what you're guiding. Uh, people say, you know, North Star is, it's another, another buzz term uh, that I just said not to use, but, um, uh, you know, figure out what is important to you and use that as a guide, but you don't have to have it all figured out and charted out. Opportunities will come your way as long as you're learning and growing and being kind and networking and, and doing all of that. So like, you're good. <laughs> Water is a cool place to work now. I don't so I'm, I'm pretty excited about everybody being uh, involved in this panel. 
Yeah, that's great. And so I guess what I heard from that is, you know, things that are kind of key to success is being able to communicate well, to adapt to different audiences, um, being able to also just be kind to people when you're communicating with them and make sure that you maintain relationships and cultivate genuine relationships. Um, I think that I feel like everyone in smart water usually comes from a strong technical base, but really what differentiates people's ability to, to really excel seems to be those interpersonal interactions. Is that kind of one of the things that a hundred percent. We're all people. So it doesn't matter the best laid plans before working in water. I worked in construction as a construction manager for large commercial and infrastructure projects. You can have the best laid plans and all of your Revit and AutoCAD and everything else and detailed out and your spec books and all that good stuff. Who's the one that actually makes that come to life is people. Hundreds of people that have to communicate and have to figure out logistically and you know how to, how to bring that to, to life. So even those of us that are the most technical still rely on people to see that through. Yeah. And, and the second thing that I heard you mention was, you know, if you don't have a five-year plan or your five-year plan, you don't know exactly what those steps are. That's okay. With an industry that's changing as quickly as, you know, the technology space, if you more so center yourself on what is my personal mission and values, what do I care about? that might be a better way to orient yourself than having specific steps. Yeah. Great. Well, I mean, I saw just to kind of kick off the Q and a, I think there was um, a question, you know, to just extend that to the rest of the panel. Uh, it seemed like that was starting good conversation. So Adele and Anna, do you kind of have anything to add as far as the good advice, bad advice? <laughs> well, uh, I'll quickly jump in here. Um, uh, there was a, a comment about the strong technical background. That's definitely not me. I have developed technical skill sets and last two years I've been in the rabbit hole of all the technical terms starting with flotation, God knows what, bio leaching and everything that to me two, three years ago didn't make any sense. And uh, it's a rabbit hole, so don't stuck don't think it comes back to my advice don't think if you have no technical background you cannot do that it's definitely if you have a vision and you don't know how to get to that technical implementation of that vision try to find who can help to translate that and and share the passion and just prove the practicality of that it's not it shouldn't be just a vision and awesome idea because there's so many awesome ideas but if you can prove it at least with some reference points and credible studies that's already halfway through. The rest is about assembling the business case around that. And believe me or not, I'm totally opposite to Ideal. If you show me Excel spreadsheet or macros, I will look at that and we have expression in Ukrainian, I'm Ukrainian. Uh, I will be looking and staring at that like a goat or a sheep at the, at the fence, literally. This is me. This is how my deep technical skills, just to let you know, guys. Uh, but definitely, I was like, uh, but on contrary, I definitely can say, okay, how we put in that impact, that impact, that impact. And then suddenly people look at me, how did you that come out? This is algorithm potentially. And my question is like, oh, it's an algorithm. Oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> so <laughs> you see what I'm saying here. Sometimes you don't know. And that's what Sivan is saying. You might not know what you know but someone has just to shape it and form it as like, all right, now we need to add this, this component and this component and suddenly you break it down into components and it becomes state of art, modular solution. And for, because if we are too scared to express it and acknowledge that and, so, and, 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 folk, and we will never even learn it. And that's uh, ex, ex, totally the point about how this industry is changing fast is just go out and, and speak and they combine the dots. Yes, some ideas will be stolen. Someone will leverage you. Someone will take advantage. But in the same time, uh, I believe in 80-20 rule that 80% will be the right people who will come and say, like, yeah, we would like to support because we already working and we have progressed. And this is exactly the component we think is missing here. And suddenly you, see, you discover synergy and good luck to the 20% because if they don't have vision, and I, I, it happened to me as well. They stuck, they took away what I have had in my head, but I couldn't progress because I didn't have enough technical skills. But they stuck on that. 
So rather than building the ecosystem, rather than advancing the scale and thinking how that's independent components can function and the orchestra or orchestrated system solution eventually, not necessarily from day one, they still stuck on that particular component. And guess what? Someone who has more resources, more finance, uh, better, slightly better expertise and more creativity will develop five more similar SaaS solutions and overtake that. And this is called Red Race. And I think what we learned here, we're moving into the collaborative ecosystem environment where everything is interconnected. Yes, commercial aspect, no one has canceled, but at the same time, we are, we, it's, uh, it's, it's a system, systemic thinking and systemic process, and we cannot separate one from another. And this is where silos exist, be it water, be it energy, be it minerals, commons, whatever. So that's my sort of add-on here. Yeah, well, I love that pushback. Yeah, because I mentioned that a lot of people generally come in with some strong technical foundation, but I agree. In my experience, the people that are in smart water, a lot of people are in business development and communications and marketing and sales. And so, you know, I think that, you know, that is, it, you're, you're completely right. That a lot of people come in with a different skill set where they can see the big picture they can understand um, things that engineers can't or programmers can't. And, and we need those people in the industry. And I think you really verbalize that beautifully. So I guess, Idel, what do you think? I, I, have three, I have three advices, very, very, very short. So the first okay. advice I would give to you guys, learn some computer program. You need to learn some computer program skill. Otherwise, um, your career would be uh, a little bit, <laughs> would be very enclosed, let's, let's say like this. You are going to open totally your horizons after learning some computer program, no matter what kind of language. You are going to enjoy it, by sure. The second advice is be a little bit like Sivan, take your risk, create a company, go to the wild. Uh, people like you are from your family will be telling you probably you're getting crazy. <laughs> you are going to be living under the bridge. I was told that. So, but uh, it is totally worth to take that, that risk. But the most important advice I will, give, I will be giving you to the engineers. So be more like Anna, believe me, go to the business oriented mindset and not so much into the problem-oriented mindset. And I was smiling the first time that someone was telling me, if you take an engineer to, to close a deal, you will not close a deal. And it's totally true. I was looking to myself in the mirror. I had a lot of problems to close a deal. I was explaining a lot about my PhD, about the mathematical stuff. And yes, they were looking at me like, wow, interesting. I was not closing the deal, no money. And at the end, I was like, well, I was doing something wrong. What is happening here? Well, there were some technical guys coming on. They had no idea of what, what I was doing. They have no technical background, but they were closing the deal. And I think it is a skill engineers have to learn. You go to an engineering school, you learn a lot of math, you learn a lot of thousand stuff. You can build great things, but you cannot close a deal. And that is something that engineers need to learn. That is going to be and making a better world, by sure. <laughs> I could not agree more with that. Um, I always uh, make my engineers go to customer meetings once a quarter. That's the guidance. If you're a junior engineer, you go to customer meetings once a quarter and you see how sales are done because, sorry to say this, no one cares about the technology. They care about the problem you know, that that technology is solving. And if you can't clearly show, demonstrate, communicate, how that technology is solving a problem that a customer is willing to pay for, it may look lovely on paper, but it's not gonna go very far in the industry. But I would say on the other hand, for people on the business side, so if any of you are business development folks or you know, looking to be more on sales consulting, this industry, especially industrial markets and, and water um, as one of those, really respects hands-on experience. So I always encourage those people to do something hands-on, whether that's it could be something like doing a Habitat for Humanity build where you volunteer and you just know how to use some basic hand tools and be out in the field and frame up a house. Um, it could be, you know, taking a class on how to operate equipment, you know, something where you've, you've demonstrated um, because you want to lead by example and, and the, the technical people that you're working with. You don't want to just be able to use your words and not be able to use your hands the same way that you're asking the technical people to use their words and not just the technical 
you know, expertise, expertise. So not all managers will help you develop those, you know, those skill sets. So if it's something that you can kind of manage up and ask to be exposed to, um, there's always professional development funds at different, you know, companies and, and ask for that experience. It'll help you uh, go a long way. Well, that's great. I mean, I think we're at the 45 minutes, but maybe you can stay on for one more question of Q&A from the audience. Uh, I didn't see anything pop up in the chat. Jade, um, is there any questions that you've seen? Uh, no, but I guess I have I have one question. Um, you know, all of you all are entrepreneurs. I'm sure a big part of your job is just trying to get the right talent into your teams. And part of the you know big benefits of having risk as part of SWAN is finding those people who want to hire talented people and then also having like talented young professionals in the same space. So my question is, um, what is like, what is one thing or what are like the key skills that you're looking for in young professionals that make them stand out and make you want to hire them? And I guess I'll ask uh, Adele first. Oh, <laughs> I have a uh... Normally the people that knows me here, they, they say I'm doing some tests, salsa dancing tests to enter working in this company. Everybody dance salsa here, but it's not, <laughs> it's not the real thing. So uh, I think um, in my case, when I, look at the, when I look at the person, I look at her eyes or his eyes and there is light, there is light in her eyes, no matter what they're doing, no matter um, if they are technical or from sales, you see that light, you see that motivation, that you see that desire of changing things or making things better. And I think that's, just, that's a, the big element that I, 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 I choose when I have to decide if I, have, if I hire someone um, or not. Sometimes we have had person here at the company without any technical background, without no status, but they were so motivated. You can see that motivation and that it makes a difference. It makes totally different. You can hire a PhD, a high standard guy, no motivation at all, it will burn your team. It will bring nothing to your team. You find, you find a high motivated person, John motivated, wanted to change things, that is the guy. But you can see it, light in her eyes, light in his eyes, that is my, my key. Nice, that's, that's awesome. I've, I've heard that from a lot of other people. Sometimes when you look at job descriptions, right at the top, they'll say, looking for motivated, so and so because that is a big part in smart water where you're trying stuff that people haven't done before you want people who are passionate about it i mean Sivan and anna do you have anything else to add to that yeah uh, i'll probably uh, uh, add one point or 100 points to what adele said about the passion uh, because natural resource management or sustainable it's about commons and commons is about humanity. If we have healthy commons, we have healthy humanity, we can build all sort of other type of uh, business models and develop all sort of other things. So the first thing is gonna be, uh, either is a sense of stewardship and belonging to this uh, planet and, and it's a serving service purpose. And this is gonna be put on the CV. This is only can be, uh, can be shown by energy level and by passion and of course ideally then should be one or two skill sets which are necessarily uh, important and uh, complementary to the team so if there is in, if there is a need of the balance technical slash engineering slash uh, chemical for instance slash data those are four um, usually ingredients for their success uh, successful developments company right now and, and finance of course capital markets so five uh, you've got to, at least that person has to have at least one point from um, a, a particular kind of component so we can, there, there can be sort of a synergy. And then it's a matter of how much, and, and, it, and then you look also at the life cycle of their project. If the life cycle is, if the project is too early, then yes, you, you can hire the super most motivated and passionate people, but you also need to understand that you need to give, give back to those people, be it finance, be it support, be it stocks, options, anything. It's not just about give, it's about, uh, sorry, take, but it's also about the give. And I, uh, so the second component, which will be here is about um, stewardship, but monetizing the stewardship and a right point of time, where well, whether we can give back or that person is the right person at this point of time, not just the right person. I think that's important. 
I think that's a, a really good point. And the only, I, just to synthesize that, um, uh, I've never described it as a as a, a light uh, in their eyes. I like that description that is much more poetic, um, but the, the way that I think about it is in terms of um, teamwork. Uh, I work in teams. I love working in teams. Like I said several times already, you know, people are, are, are what, uh, and, and groups and teams are what make things happen. And so I'm looking for, do is this person going to be uh, somebody that I want to work with day in and day out, and that's going to add to our overall team culture. By the time you're in the interview, I've already looked at your resume. I already know what your, you know, uh, background is, and so I'm really getting to know you to understand if I want to, want you to be part of my team because that's why I'm working with every day. We're spending oftentimes more time with our coworkers than with our spouses and with other people in our life. So is this somebody that I want to rely on and work with to achieve this common goal? uh you know day, day to day and i will say for me um arrogance and ego is just a it's a hard line um so just uh you know also be be humble um and have a lot of, and have questions that you ask during your interview as well that's always something that i pay attention to is if somebody has well thought out questions that they've come to the meeting with meaning that they've prepared for the meeting which is important five mojitos and a salsa bar and you will know if they can play with you and your team fine or not believe me. i'm not sure if like hr will allow us to do that kind of interviewing here in the us but you know we could certainly we could certainly try that out i wouldn't object <laughs> oh well thank you everyone so much um i like this whole discussion i feel like everyone here has a light in their eyes so everyone would be part of a, a great smart water team um sandy can you kind of wrap us up with that final slide and uh kind of um, wrapping up the, the webinar. Sure thing. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. That was super inspiring. I took so many notes, got so many tidbits from you guys. I hope everyone else in the audience did as well. Uh, first off, if you guys have any ideas for mentors that you'd like to see on the next episode, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please take the feedback survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. And same, you know what I just said about future episodes, who you want to see up on this stage. And yeah, thank you to our amazing panelists and to Billy for moderating. And have a great day, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.